But I want to share with you, if uh, Pastor, you put that slide up for me, is Christianity real? Is Christianity real? I believe that this will help us to really understand some things as we look at the answer through the life of the Apostle Paul. Is Christianity real? Because many of us have questions, and you know, a lot of times people say, well, I don't want to be a Christian, I don't want to have blind faith. Uh, it's not blind faith. It is not just saying uh, I have faith, but Christianity has been established on eyewitnesses, has been established on historical accounts. Uh, to, de to deny that would be to deny history. Uh, there's historical non-biblical accounts, such as the historian Jose Josephus, who was a Jewish born-again Christian, who wrote... Uh, during the, I believe it was uh, AD, uh, B, BC, 4 BC, somewhere around that area, uh, or AD. Uh, I believe that uh, he has great insight into uh, Christianity and what was going on in some of the other secular writers that were out there that were not, they, were you know, they weren't biased or anything, they were just historians and wrote history that proved of the spread of Christianity in the early centuries. So this morning I want to share with you about the Apostle Paul. I want to share about how we can know that Christianity is real uh, by this one particular eyewitness uh, and what he had experienced in his life that will take us to a point of actually looking at Christianity in a different format. The answer is through the life of the Apostle Paul. And I just want to give you my introduction this morning, if I may. <clears throat> We all admire the Apostle Paul and what a great impact that the Apostle Paul has had on Christianity. Um, but it, always, it wasn't always the case with the Apostle Paul. Before his conversion to Christianity, you and I would have looked at him and said to ourselves, there is no way that this man could ever be a Christian. There was no desire in his heart to change religions. The Apostle Paul was one of the most devoted of his time to his particular religion. He was dedicated to his religion, and he would have risked his own life in order to uh, promote that religion. He was a Hebrew scholar. Many people don't know that, but he was a Hebrew scholar and very educated in his faith. He attained the position of rabbi, and he knew the law of Moses better than most of his associates. He was a member of the Sanhedrin Council, and he was a Pharisaical Jew with a very rich heritage. And I'm going to ask Brother Tom, if you please, put up Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. I'm giving you a little bit of background so that you can see uh, the Apostle Paul and what was his life's story. Philippians chapter 3, verses 4 to 6. He said, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And I want to stop there for a moment because I want to give you a little bit of insight into the Apostle Paul as I was reading and studying different uh, uh, historical accounts of Paul's life. I began to see that uh, the Apostle Paul grew up in a very affluent lifestyle. Uh, the Apostle Paul, he had, his family was very wealthy. And the Apostle Paul had not only um, religious affiliations, but he also had political affiliations. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along. You might remember Paul stating one time in the book of Acts, I believe it's in chapter 9, if I'm mistaken, I could, I could be mistaken, but I believe it's chapter 9, where he got to speak before some uh, Jews and, he's, and the Romans, and they had him bound, and he says, why are you binding me, a Roman? And when they found out that he was a Roman, they were all scared because they knew that he was, he was, he was, a, he was protected under the Roman law. 
See, the Apostle Paul not only was protected under Roman law, but there was a time when he was... Uh, let me just read that if I can. Let me, I, I just want to read that uh, Philippians first. Let me get through that. Uh, the next verse. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee. So we understand he was a Pharisee. Now you all know about the Pharisees. Some of you may know, some of you may not know, that the Pharisees, they love the chief seats. They love to be seen. They love to be up in the front. They love to have notoriety. They, know, they would love to be in the forefront of everything that's going on and have all the attention. Remember Jesus said, if you come into a, a place, take the seat in the back. And if they want, you'll be elevated. They'll bring you to the front. But if you come into the front... And then they tell you, go into the back because we have that seat safe for someone, you'll be a little embarrassed. I'm kind of paraphrasing that a little bit. But the Pharisees, he was a Pharisee, as touching the law, a Pharisee. He was very religious. He was a rabbi. He was, intellect, he was an intellectual. His family had money. They came from a very prestigious family. They had a lot of pride a lot of arrogance in their life. Next verse, please. Concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law blameless. Well, according to his estimation. He was disciplined and he was strictly devoted in his service for God and he believed in what's called the Shema. The Shema was Deuteronomy 6.4, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. He was monotheistic in his belief. And what does that mean, being monotheistic? It means he believed in only one God. Now here is the, here is the fallacy that a lot of people think about Christianity. They think that because we believe in Trinity, we believe, we believe in three gods. We don't. Christianity is a monotheistic religion. We believe in one God existing in three persons in essence and nature. And there's the difference. We don't believe in three separate gods. That's called tritheism. We don't believe in tritheism. We believe in the Shama just like the Jewish religion does. We believe in one God. We're monotheistic existing in three persons in Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in essence, in nature. So you have to understand the Apostle Paul, where he's coming from, being monotheistic in the Jewish religion, he believed that God was only one. Okay. So now we are going to take a look at Paul's life before his conversion to see how zealous he was as a non-believer toward Christianity. I want to share with you this morning my three main points, and my three main points will be this. Number one, his violent pursuit of eradicating Christianity. That was his number one goal in life. When this Christian thing began to come on the scene, the Apostle Paul's one endeavor in life and one objective in life was to eradicate Christianity. So now you see why, if we were to look at this person from the natural standpoint, we would say, this person will never come to Jesus. It's, a, it's almost impossible. My second point is, what was able to change his thinking? And my third point is, if God can change Saul, then he could change anyone. So let's look, number one, first and foremost, his violent pursuit of eradicating Christianity. Turn with me, please, to the book of Acts, chapter 9, starting with verse 1. Turn with me, please. I'm going to give you a little background about the character of the Apostle Paul, and I believe that's going to help us to understand why this man is a good example of how we can prove that Christianity is real. Starting with verse 1. And I understand that Paul's name was Saul at one time, and God changed his name from Saul to Paul. So when you hear me say Saul and Paul, 
understand when I use the name Saul, it's because I'm speaking prior to his conversion. When I speak of Paul, it is after his conversion. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went, out, went unto the high priest. And I want to stop for a moment. The first part of this scripture in Acts chapter 9, let me just get to that point right here in my Bible. It says, but Saul, still breathing threats and murder, I'm using the uh, New American Standard Version, uh, still breathing threats and murder. Am I using that version? No, I'm sorry, I'm using the English Standard Version. Still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. Now, this is a, first part of the sentence is a metaphorical expression. And Saul yet breathing. Now, that doesn't mean his natural breathing. Of course, he's breathing. He's alive. He didn't stop breathing. So what does that mean? You have to look up that terminology. And it says that when he said, still breathing, it means the threatenings and the slaughter were, so to speak, the element from which he drew his breath. In other words, he lived and he, and he breathed and he gave every waking moment that he could to the threatenings and the slaughter of the disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everything, his life, his breath, it represents life. Everything about his life, his number one objective in life was to annihilate, to eliminate Christianity. Pretty mean, huh? Pretty mean person. That's what he was doing. He says, verse 2, And desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, any of those who were Christians, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. That was his purpose. I like what the uh, English version says. But Saul was ravaging the church. That word ravaging means he was out to destroy it. He was out to take it down. He w and, and all this time, understand this, the Pharisee, Pharisee thinking was that they're doing God a service. He was doing all of this in the name of God. The God of Judaism, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus already told his disciples, he said, if they persecuted me, they're going to persecute you. The message hasn't changed. It's still the same. I believe that if you're a true Christian, and you're living a true Christian life, you are going to offend people. Because the Bible says the gospel is an offense. Nowhere did God ever intend the gospel to be a socially acceptable message. Read throughout all the New Testament, you'll find that there are more troubles given to Christians. You go to third world countries, and you sit in these countries, and if you are a professed Christian, Amongst the Hindu or Muslim nation, you don't get any jobs. You're last on, on, on the list of everything. You're lower than uh, dung. You are considered an outcast. And I want you to get this picture in your mind because this is what Christianity is costing some of our brethren around the world today, right now. And Paul's, Saul's uh, main objective was to ravage the church. And it says, and he entered house after house, and he dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. And I want you to see this side of, of the Apostle Paul, because it's very, very, very important. Let's look at Galatians chapter 1. 
Verse 13 and 14. Galatians chapter 1. I'm going to have you in the, in the scriptures today. Looking through the word. And the Apostle Paul here says, For you, meaning the Galatians, you have heard of my lifestyle, my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure, you see that? Beyond measure, I what? Persecuted the church of God and wasted it. I'm trying to get you to understand that the Apostle Paul was a very mean, vindictive, self-righteous person. He was socially, he was of affluency, he was an aristocrat, if you will. In society, he had money, he had position, he had fame. All of that was going on in the Apostle Paul's life. Think about it. His family was well respected. In fact, he was not, he was not even given citizenship where um, people had to at, at one time pay a lot of money to attain that from Rome. But the Apostle Paul says in one part of the scripture, he says, I was born free. So that means that his family had such an influence in in. In politics, not only his father and mother, but even succeed, you know, preceding generations, that they were well known to not even have to pay for that freedom. And understand, he was Jewish. Rome conquered the Jewish nation. And so the Jews were really under the Romans' tyranny. They were a conquered nation. But yet here... These Jews, the Apostle Paul, his family, were in such a social position that anyone born in their families were automatically accepted as Roman citizens. So you see the importance that he had? You see how, you know, we call them VIPs, very important persons. You see how, how, how much of a VIP Paul was in his time? Highly educated under Gamaliel, one of the greatest teachers that ever lived of his time. The best education. The Apostle Paul had the best of everything. Next verse, please. He says, You have heard of my former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church of God. I like the English version. It says, Violently, violently, and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people, so extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Hmm. That's amazing. Saul was of a predominant temperament called caloric personality type. You say, well, what's that? Well, we all have different personality types. We're all different. One person, like my wife, can her person. One of the one of the strengths of her personality trait is that she can remember names. And sometimes I'll say to her, "What was that person's name?" And she she knows that person's name. Now there are other personality traits that are very bad with names, and I'm very bad with names. Another one is raising their head, and I see a couple of shaking their head. Yes, okay. The personality trait you're just bad with names. I can remember faces, but I'm terrible with names. But Paul was the type which we would call a caloric, a caloric personal, a personality type. What is that? This temperament had some strong points and some weak points. We all have different strong points and weak points in our personality traits. And there's four major temperament traits. There's your caloric there's your sanguine, there's your phlegmatic, and your melancholy. Those are four temperament traits. Now you can be 50% of one, 30%, 20%, 10, it all depends. You can have a little bit of everything. But you will have one predominant one in your life. 
But for the sake of time, I'm going to only show the weak points of the Apostle Paul's personality because I wanted to get a glimpse of what this man was like. I'm going to show you just the weak points of the personality trait called the caloric personality. Number one, he was extremely, extremely self-centered. Everything centered around him. And the thing about it is they don't really appear to be that way. Okay? Indirect behavior, they reject people. They reject the love and affections of people. Oh, they will accept love and affection only according to their terms. And usually, cruel to those who reject their manipulation for love and affection. That's a caloric personality. Secondly, they're hot-tempered and they're people users. And I could tell you, people that have been a part of this church, I, they have this exact temperament. I know temperaments. In fact, my former pastor wrote me a letter of recommendation saying that, that I have a keen insight into the temperament, four temperament traits in counseling. Uh, from uh, Dr. George Cootie, he gave me that recommendation. That I know people well through their personality traits. And that's why when I talk to you sometime, I know some of the things that you go through because I know your personality type, and I know exactly how to get around that personality type and how you can have victory. So he was hot-tempered, he was a people user, and although everyone can kind of use people to some degree, that's true. The caloric is inclusion, carries a red flag with them all times. They think of themselves as people motivators, but they're really bossy. <laughs> they think they can motivate people, and they probably can. They become easily frustrated, though, in their attempts to motivate people that don't want to be motivated. And they harbor anger and can be cruel and abusive. Are you getting a, a picture of the Apostle Paul that you didn't have before? Okay. I, that's what I want to do. I want to paint a picture of him of how he was okay, before his conversion. Three, he was angry and, and cruel. Capable of undertaking any kind of behavior to keep control. They can be smiling on the outside, raging on the inside. They associate themselves with weak people, and then they resent their weaknesses. To them, the ends justify the means. In other words, to a caloric personality trait, if I want to get to point B, from point A, it doesn't matter how I get there as long as I get there. I can lie. I can cheat. I can say things that are not true. It doesn't matter. To a caloric personality, now understand, I'm talking about one who is, is pre-converted. Before that, you will manipulate your way any way you can to get to point B. That's the Apostle Paul. That's how he was. Let's look at a further description in Acts chapter 22. Acts chapter 22. Starting with verse 1. The apostle, uh, he says, Men and brethren and fathers, hear ye my defense, which I now make unto you. And when they heard that, he spoke in Hebrew, meaning Paul, he spoke in the Hebrew tongue to them. They kept the more silence, and he said, I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Sicily, yet brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel. That was his teacher. And taught according to the perfect manner of the law of the fathers and was zealous toward God. You understand? He, he, thought, he, he thought he knew God. There are a lot of people today, they think they know God. Just like the Apostle Paul. And understand, he was under one of the greatest teachers of his time, Gamaliel. As ye all are this day. And I persecuted this way unto the death. He was putting Christians to death. He was making sure and bearing witness in, in, the, in the court of the Pharisees 
and giving his okay to put people, Christians, your brothers and sisters and mine, to death. That's the kind of cruel, angry, resentful, hurtful personality the Apostle Paul was. He was rich, he had affluence, he had social acceptance, his family was well heated in society. Then he says in verse 5, And also the high priest doth bear me witness, and all the estate of the elders, from whom also I received letters unto the brethren, and went to Damascus to bring them which were there bound to Jerusalem, far to be punished. See, because the Apostle Paul thought he was right. The Apostle Paul, understand there was a tremendous, tremendous influence of the Greek culture and Greek philosophers and ideologies. That's why he wrote in another part, let no man spoil you through vain philosophies. He knew about all of these philosophies. He knew about all these ideologies. He was a very educated man. So, here you see the, a picture of the Apostle Paul. You see how he was. He was angry, bitter, vehemently against Christianity, wanted to eradicate Christianity, and he thought he was doing it under the banner of God. I'm doing this for God. This is what I'm doing. Almost like the Islams today. They believe that they're doing it for God. And that's why I believe that there's not a Muslim or someone who is involved in the Islamic faith that cannot be reached with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't care how steep they are in it like the Apostle Paul was. Or maybe some of you maybe have some ideologies or philosophies that you're wondering about Christianity. But here is this man, okay, born free, born a Roman citizen. And we can see that in verse, let me see, that's in verse 22 of chapter 9. You could just jump down to verse 22. It says, And they gave him audience unto his word, and he lifted up their voice and said, Away with such a fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. This is the Apostle Paul. This is when they wanted to persecute him after he was a Christian. And if you look in uh, verse 25, it says, And as they bound him with th uh, thongs, Paul said, and those, please, that's not the, the same thing as today. Okay, those are, those are hand bracelets, okay? Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? When the centurion heard that, he went out and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what you do to this man, he's a Roman. Then the chief captain said to him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. Verse 28, The chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. In other words, what he was telling Paul was, Hey, I'm a Roman citizen, but I had to pay a lot of money. Look what Paul's response was. And Paul said, but I was freeborn. You could almost hear him say, yeah, you had to pay for it, but I didn't. That's how much influence his family had. Do you understand? That's the kind of person the Apostle Paul was. Which brings me to my second point. What was, a, what, what was able to change his thinking? He had everything going for him. Money, prestige, position, acceptable so, you know, accepted socially, had a, a wealthy family, was affluent in society, had money, had everything he needed. He was arrogant, hot-headed, cruel, and he had such a sharp tongue that he could slice you up into a thousand pieces. And believe me, I know what I'm talking about because I worked under a caloric personality in the ministry. And believe me, they know how to cut you up one way and down the other okay, and think nothing of it. And this was a Christian, this was a minister that I sat under, was able to do that. 
the Lord said to me, you just keep quiet. You just sit there. And as I sat there being lambasted by his tongue, crushed by his tongue, tears running in my eye, wanting to run, wanting to get up and get out of there. The Lord said, son, sit there and take it. That's why I know when I tell somebody, don't run. I'm telling you from personal experience. Because you run, God will put another person in the same position because he's trying to get something out of me. See, I was a runner. Not one physically to be in shape, but I was a runner when I would face situations. If, if it was a lot of opposition, I would run the other way. Because I didn't like confrontation. You, pastor, didn't like confrontation? <laughs> I can't believe that. Yeah, that was pre-conversion. Get up and sing in front of people? Forget it. Wouldn't do it. Unless I had a few drinks in me. Now, in order for Saul to do an about face in his way of thinking, there must have been surmountable, listen to this, surmountable conclusive evidence to change his way of thinking and to change his religion. He was very educated. No one could convince him that what, what he was doing was wrong. So God knew that and had to allow Paul to have a divine encounter with the living Savior, Jesus Christ. So let's see what the Bible says about the encounter that Saul had. Let's look at Acts chapter 9 again. I'm flipping you back and forth this morning. Please forgive me. Acts chapter 9. It says, but Saul was breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. He went into the high priest. He asked him from these letters to Damascus unto the synagogues that if he found any that were on this way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. In verse 3. And as he journeyed, so many times he journeyed with that purpose in mind, with that objective, to destroy, to tear apart, to ravage the church of Jesus Christ and Christianity. But as he journeyed, it came to pass that he drew close to Damascus. And suddenly, there shone about him a light out of heaven. Now you might say, well, the Apostle Paul, he could have made this up when he wrote the book of Acts. But I have to tell you one thing that's kind of might shock you, but the Apostle Paul didn't write Acts. Luke wrote Acts. So you have another account of somebody that is writing the historical facts down. And he says, suddenly there shone round about him a light out of heaven. Isn't it amazing, and I'll just jump a little ahead here, that he says to Paul, I'm calling you to be a light unto the Gentiles. To open the blinded eyes. Please understand what I'm about to say. Don't believe every person that comes on television and says that they went to heaven and they saw a bright light. Or they experienced in their life Jesus coming, sitting on their bed and having a conversation with Jesus. Don't believe it for a moment. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. You will find nowhere in the New Testament, anywhere, that Jesus, after his ascension, his feet ever touched the earth again. It says he heard a voice from heaven. A light from heaven shined down. The light was so powerful, and, and I believe that's what it says in Timothy, the first and second Timothy says, that God dwells in unapproachable light. God dwells in unapproachable light. No man can approach that light without having an effect on him. And when this light shone from heaven, it says the Apostle Paul saw the light and he was thrown to the earth. Next verse. First he heard a voice. No, I'm sorry. And he fell to the earth. Now, here's another supposition of many people. Okay? 
They say because it says he fell to the earth, they automatically think he was riding a horse. A lot of commentaries say, well, Paul fell off a horse. Let me say this to you. Do you see the horse anywhere in that scripture? No. That's a supposition. That's presupposed that he was riding a horse. There's no evidence that he was. You can be walking and fall to the ground. Okay? So we don't get splitting hairs on that particular aspect. We don't split hairs. He could have been riding a camel. He could have been riding a donkey. He could have been riding in a carriage. For all we know. We don't, we don't know, so we're not picky about what he was doing, whether he was walking or not. But he heard a voice. Right away in our clinical world that we live in today, we say it's schizophrenic. Hearing things, multiple uh, personality disorder. We put a medical term on him. Hearing voices. Give him medication. <laughs> but he heard a voice, and the voice said to him, and I want you to understand this. The voice spoke to him as Saul pre-conversion. He said, Saul, Saul. What was Saul doing? What was his main objective in life? To destroy Christianity, right? To destroy Christians. To bring them bound to prison and to cast a vote for their death. To annihilate Christianity. That was his objective. But the voice says to him, Saul, Saul. Why are you persecuting me? Huh? How can this voice from heaven say, Paul, Saul, Saul, how are you persecuting me? He was persecuting the church. Because Jesus said these words and it, it just rings so true in life. He said, if you offend one of these little ones, if you've done it to the least of these, my brethren, you have done it as unto me. See, his word is true. Verse 5, please. And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, Listen to me. He said these two words first. I am. Anytime someone said, I am, if God said, I am, he's I am that I am. He said, I am Yahshua, the Messiah. Understand, he's revealing himself to a Jew, not a Gentile. And that's how he would have revealed himself. He wouldn't have said, I am Jesus. That's the, that's the English version. He would have said, I am Yahshua. Whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. He says, but rise and enter into the city and it shall be told thee what you must do. And verse 7, in case there's any skeptics. Verse 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless. There was somebody with him. He had eyewitnesses. Hearing a voice, they heard the voice. There were eyewitnesses, but they saw no man to that voice. So we know it wasn't a psychological event that Paul was experiencing. It wasn't because he had a split personality or something on that nature. Or he was schizophrenic and he was hearing voices. Because the other men wouldn't have heard it. Only he would have heard it. So we have to dismiss the medical aspect of the psychological effect. And say, there were other men which journeyed with him, stood speechless. Because they heard a voice but they saw no man. So that makes the testimony of what Paul, what Luke was writing in the book of Acts to be true. 
Hello. And Saul arose from the earth and he went. And when his eyes were open, he saw nothing. He was blind. They led him by the hand and brought him to Damascus. And he was there three days. And without sight, he neither ate nor drank. Now you understand the platform of the Apostle Paul. You understand what he was like. He was cruel, sharp tongue, would cut you up in a million pieces. He was a people user for his own advantage. He was wealthy, had prestige, had a place of affluence in society. Now, when I give you this scripture, you'll understand no longer Saul, but Paul. When I share this scripture with you. Philippians chapter 3. My third point, my third point, if God could change Saul, then he can change anyone. This scripture will have so much more meaning to you now, what I'm going to share with you. In verse 7, he said, but what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. For a Jew to renounce his religion and convert to another religion meant that he would be ostracized from his family, from his position of wealth, of influence in society. He went from a person who was used to condemn the church to one of the condemned. He went from a place of being accepted in society to being rejected by society. And he goes on and he says, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And to count them but dumb, that I may win Christ. When you understand how much this man gave up, how much this man turned his back on, proves that Christianity is real. No man would be willing in their natural state and being to turn away from so many things if what they were believing was a lie. He says, I count all things as lost. And I suffered the loss of all things. Understand, his parents, when someone converted from the Jewish faith to a Christian, to a Christian faith, first thing was they cut you off. Secondly, they would disown you. Thirdly, they'd have a mock funeral for you. You were no longer considered their son or daughter any longer. No longer would you be recognized as a rabbi. No longer would you be recognized in society. No longer will you have the money and support of your family. Not only just monetarily, but physically, financially, mentally, spiritually. That's why when the Apostle Paul says, all forsook me. He was able to continue on because he already experienced that with his own family. But when he went into the ministry and others forsook him, he was able to endure that because of what he had endured 
from his own personal family life. Remember I told you he was very self-centered. Right? Now watch this other scripture come into being. When he said in Galatians. It is no longer I that live. It, but Christ lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It's no longer I, self-centered Paul, a Saul. It's no longer I using people, manipulating people. It's no longer I that live. And that's why he became one of the most effective missionaries the world has ever seen. Because he lived a selfless life. And was willing to die for his faith. When they took him, they bound him to bring him to Rome for trial. On false accusations. And they put him in prison. While he was in that prison. Was he thinking only of himself? How do we know that? How do we know the apostle Paul was not just thinking of himself. While he was sitting in, the, in that prison cell. Yes. Thank you. He wrote Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Those are known as the prison epistles. And that's why you have them in your Bible. We flippantly open the book and look in Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and we just take for granted it's there. But that man cost him his life to sit in a prison. So that he would write that letter to those churches. So that you and I could learn that it is no longer I that liveth. But Christ liveth in me. So examine your life. What have you given up for Christ? In comparison to the Apostle Paul. What have you sacrificed in this life? To serve your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. If God could change the thinking and the religion of this astute Jewish rabbi. Who was hell bent on destroying and actually eradicating Christianity. That was his life. That was his breath. That's what he did. He was assigned by, I believe, the devil. To wipe out Christianity. And it took this one encounter. This one thing. This one voice. To take a man's life. And turn it upside down. Willing. To leave all the riches of this world. Willing. To go through humiliation. Persecution. Of his own family. Rejection. From his own family. Why? Why? Because he said, I look to the mark of the high calling of God. That there is no greater prestige or social acceptability or affluence or arist aristocratic thinking that can even our occupation or our providence 
of whatever you can do in your life. He said, there is nothing that can compare to the calling of God. For I look to the mark of the high calling of God. I forget those things which are behind. Which meant the hurt, the pain. He was human. He experienced rejection from his family. He experienced rejection from his friends. He experienced rejection from society. But wasn't that what Jesus said? If they rejected me, they'll reject you. Yeah, Isaiah says about Jesus, he was a man rejected of, in sorrows and grief. He was rejected. We're going to be rejected, but we can't let those emotions and feelings dictate to us our commitment. We sing the song, though none go with me, still will I follow. We see the dramatic, dramatic, dramatic conversion of Saul into Paul. And what took place was a divine encounter. Something that went beyond the natural. Something that went beyond just handing him a track. Hello? In fact, when Paul was converted and they started to bring them around the Christians, they even, even the one that God, uh, Ananias, when, when God called him to go and, and to lay his hands on Paul so that he'd receive the Holy Spirit and he'd receive his eyesight, even he was skeptic. He said, but Lord, he said, this man persecutes us. This man places Christians in jail. This could be a setup. And the Lord spoke to Ananias and said, He's my chosen vessel. I have called him. Go. Go. Never mind trying to rationalize what he's done. Paul said, You can imagine when he said in Ephesians, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for it is right. Because his parents rejected him. See, children are to obey their parents as long as it's justified. But if they are trying to get you to do something that's opposing to God, you don't do it. Then you have to please God and not man. But here the Apostle Paul's mind was changed. This cataclysmic event that took place in his life changed his life forever. And he knew what the end of that life was going to be because he was the one that persecuted and killed Christians. Even at Stephen's death, remember Stephen? When he was stoned, it says that the person that was standing there, they put their coats before, was, was Saul. Saul was at the stoning of Stephen. He even okayed the stoning of Stephen. He even gave his vote to kill Stephen. Let me ask you this question. Do you ever think that a murderer of a Christian, that God could ever forgive somebody like that? Look what he did. He called the Apostle Paul. He forgave him. Let me ask you this question. Is there anything in your life he can't forgive? No. Is there anyone in anyone's life that God can't forgive? No. If they cry out in repentance to God, he will forgive. And he will change you from a Saul to a Paul. If you're willing to surrender all. And that's the key. When Paul came to the conclusion that what he had done in his life was wrong. That his, what he thought was a service of God was not really a service of God at all. That he was persecuting Yeshua the Messiah. When he came to that conclusion in his mind. When he came to that conclusion he decided that he was going to hear to the voice that he heard. And he was going to repent of his sins. And Ananias went and laid his hands on him and he received the Holy Ghost. And he saw again, his eyesight came back. And it says the first thing he started to do was go out and preach. And many were being converted. So let me ask you this question. Does that prove Christianity? Absolutely. 
Because Christianity is not a religion. A religion cannot change you. Going to church will not change you. Reading your Bible won't change you. It's when you are converted. It's when you are changed by the power of God. There's a transformation that takes place. And I would include that in anyone who's listening to the CD this morning. And there may be someone out there. You may be a Muslim. You may be, you may be a religious person. Or you may be a persecutor. You may be someone who just hates Christianity. But I want you to know this morning that there's a God who can forgive you. A God who can give you in a divine encounter. Give you a divine encounter where you will never be the same and you will sell out for Jesus Christ. Because no matter what you do in this life, no matter what your goals are, no matter how much education you attain, no matter how much money you attain, no matter how much fortune and fame you attain, it's all done in comparison to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to encourage you this morning to get this CD and give it to somebody. Because there's such truth in the Word of God, such truth that Christianity is real, And that we can prove it through the Apostle Paul's life. Every head bow, please. How much does your Christianity mean to you? Is it just a formality to come on Sunday, sit in a chair, so distracted, not even listening to the message? is showing an appearance? Or has the gospel of Jesus Christ made such an impact on your life that you are willing to give up everything for the knowledge of Christ Jesus? Would you, like Paul, say, I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ? And to suffer the loss of all things. Father, I pray for those who are here this morning. If there's anyone who doesn't know you in this real transformation, I pray, God, this morning they will repent of their sins. They will ask you to come into their life and be the Lord and Master of their life. That, God, you are real. That you're... You're not an imaginary God. You're not a makeup God. But you are God. And I pray for those who will be listening on the CD. I pray for you this morning that your eyes of understanding will be opened and that the light of the glorious gospel will shine upon you. That you will see that Christianity is true and that you can have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ by confessing your sin to him, saying, I am a sinner. Admit to God that you've sinned against him. Repent, ask God for forgiveness. Receive the sacrifice of Yeshua, Christ Jesus, that he died on the cross for you. Receive it personally. Believe in your heart that God raised Christ from the dead, and you shall be saved. I want you to understand that if you need some materials, please write to us. Where is Glory Christian Assembly, Post Office Box 51325, New Bedford, Mass. 02745. We'll try to get out some literature to you. Is anyone here? You say, Pastor, after hearing this message and seeing the commitment of the Apostle Paul, man, i got a long way to go. I would encourage you, even though you have a long way to go, keep on going. and Don't give up. Don't turn away. Don't walk away. For God is doing great things 
in and, uh, in and through your life and get ready to be used by him in these last days for a witness to this one living, saving God we all serve named Jesus Christ. God bless you. May God's light shine upon you. May there be further revelation in your heart and mind of today's message. As you go home and meditate on it, I pray that you will grab even more meat from what has been taught this morning, that you will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray the peace of God, which goes beyond understanding, beyond each and every one of your homes, and that you walk in peace and love, and that the protection of the Holy Spirit and his holy angels would keep you from the onslaught of the enemy this week. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, Amen. God bless you this morning.